<laughs> oh, hey. I'm not the only lurker, most excellent. Yes. Do we have any uh, agenda items? I'm not sure what the... Uh, we have my version proposal. Oh, okay. Cool. I don't know if it's worth... Do we have anyone who hasn't already talked about it at length? Yeah. I mean, covering your 30-page documents in uh, this meeting might be difficult. Hey, the right I talk, I can go through a page of it. That's true. <laughs> it's quite, quite possible. Uh, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll get Alyssa to do oh, that. So. <laughs> got it. This you. I haven't read the full doc. You shouldn't have read I just it. saw it was 27 pages, and I'm like, so Matt said we're getting a summary, right? Right? Something like that. Uh, you, you should read all, and write audio books. There is, there is something to be said about making a document long enough that no one will read it and they'll just say yes. So that is a, that is a strategy. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I mean, basically I feel like unless there's any strong pushback on the versioning proposal, uh, it's just, we'll start rolling it with it. I mean, I'm right now I'm working on uh, the next TDS PR and once that's done, yeah, I'll start actually working on some of the machinery and things that we need to actually make this all for. Are there, I, I guess my question is, are there any remaining open issues? Because I know we had some concerns about either the timelines of things, and then I know there are some concerns around the, uh, like how people set deprecated, which is part of this TDS proposal. So I just, I, I'm having a hard time wrapping my head around, like, are, are we good or are there still open issues? We have a list of open questions in the doc and they're very, they're not very interesting. Um, I mean, some of them are like, you know, when are we actually gonna really deprecate V2 as it stands today? Um, I think what we'll do is we'll go to um, come, uh, yeah, we'll essentially work towards having V3 stable APIs ready uh, based on the existing V2 with, you know, some cleanup by the end of Q2. And then we will also have um, V4 alpha. So we'll have three APIs at the end of Q2, V2, V3, and V4 alpha. Okay. Yeah, I, I guess my my sense is that it's going to become clear once you build the tooling. <laughs> like there's, there's probably, I mean, there's some, I guess conceptually this all makes sense to me, but, but I feel like until we can play with the developer flow, um, it's not, it's not quite as clear what the implications are. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Um, so that, that's why I think you want to set up a tool, a playground. So we have two separate things we need to do by the end of Q2. The first is get the V3 APIs ready. And I think a lot of that's going to be pretty mechanical. Is already clear that there are places we can clean up stuff like using a unified header map format and yep. you know, all these places where we know we've replicated things. And it'll largely just be a refactoring. I don't imagine any significant real change. Yep. We'll clean up one offs and all this kind of stuff. And then there will be the, um, the actual tooling to support all of that. And that's, uh, that, that's probably where the most of the work will be. Yeah. The thing I have the largest concerns about, and again, we, we can handle them, but we need to make sure we do, or when I say we, I mean Harvey, um, is the pushback we'll get specifically from Google Cloud, like a guarantee that we're going to. And so what we need to do is the, the moment we cut something, go to them and say, you need you need to do your comms now. You need to act that you've done your comms. The clock is ticking and I'm going to. Yeah. Yeah. Three year prep rather than two years. I mean, basically what we'll, when we, when we push stuff into V3 at the end of this quarter, nothing that's been basically deprecated will survive into that v3 api yeah um you know have to go to them with this yeah. no, no no but my, my point is yeah. is that if we if we think backwards a year before we remove anything a year and a quarter before we remove anything we have to get those teams actively like you have a p0 internal do your comms before the end of the quarter because you know, your policy requires a year warning to customers and you've got a year and a quarter. So by end of quarter, you have- Yeah, one, one of the things that I was, I, I was thinking about is I almost wonder, you know, we don't, we don't use the Envoy announce list very much or very consistently. Yeah. And I guess one of the things that I'm wondering, and again, this is me just brainstorming out loud, is should we have something similar to the security distributors list for like 
deprecation clock tick, right? So that people that care, you know, they're going to get uh, like a cadence of announcements on a particular email list for distributors, which basically says, you know, this is when the clock starts. This is when it's when it's going to be going to be done. And and to be honest, I don't see it as any different than when Ubuntu does long long term stable releases, and they say, you know, it lives until X date, and here's where we're doing patches, and then we're no longer supporting it. These these calendars are you know they're they're written down and they're well understood. So I'm wondering if we just need to get more prescriptive about actually having a calendar that people can look at. Yeah, I mean, I think that is absolutely a worthwhile thing and we should do it. I think that the odds of that solving the problem I'm concerned about are very low. Because yeah, probably not. People internally filter. Like, so I think, again, it behooves us as the ambassadors between Envoy and, and yeah. to like, well, be like, hey, there's this calendar, here's your P0. Like, but it's not just, but it's not, not, it's not even just the cloud yeah, providers. I mean, like we, having that cadence and saying, look, we, we've got right. is, is totally worthwhile. Right. I'm just saying like, even, even here at Lyft, much smaller company, one customer, we have the same problem and so does everyone else where no one wants to deal with the deprecations until the code is gone, right? So, okay, so well, it's- I think the, the fatal by default will take care of that. And I yes. think and we can make the old things fatal by default a quarter before. Yeah. I actually think that that mechanical aspect is, is going to be mostly addressed. It's, because I yeah. feel like having your binary not start up is a much better signal than getting an email. I think you're right. Um, yeah, absolutely. But I mean, I, there, there is there is absolutely no harm in doing better communication. And given that it's a quarterly cadence, it's not like a whole ton of, yeah. you know, it's it's a it's a one-off script and then they name the script. Yeah. Um, but again, yeah, well, the actual migrations for people running their own envoys aren't, I'm no longer concerned with because fatal by default. The yeah. uh, communication of cadence, I think is just flat out worthwhile. And then okay. my concern is, is Harvey and I being in the middle <laughs> of two yeah. things where that they don't end up in conflict. Yep. Okay. Uh, so, okay. So getting back to the proposal, I guess we've had a few people join us. So kind of curious from the folks who've joined, <coughs> haven't already read the proposal or have read it, what you would be interested in having me cover here? And just for context, this is the uh, API versioning and the stable Envoy API versioning policy, which uh, is linked in the minutes. As you say, if, if, if no one raises questions, I mean, this, this, this meeting is being recorded, so it might be worth it just to give like, okay, like, so okay, like, okay, like, like a five minute summary, you know? Sure. So, you know, there've been some concerns that uh, the V2 APIs have not had the stability properties that are necessary for cloud operators or folks who are adopting Envoy's APIs outside of the Envoy code base. Uh, the most prominent example of this is GRPC LB, who have committed to replacing their proprietary client-side, book-side load balancing uh, control plane protocol with that of uh, Envoy's. They're using XDS essentially. And so, you know, you can kind of see how this, uh, how we got here. We, we moved from the V1 APIs, which are very sort of RESTful and JSON schema based to Thing which was proto based, which in theory had the promise of you know real backwards compatibility, but we were playing a bit loose and fast, even though we had an official policy for breaking changes and we were, we were not you know chaotically and randomly turning things down. Um, we were not maintaining wire compatibility over the long term, and there's a bunch of best practices over how to do this uh, that have grown up at places like Google and offering like cloud APIs which uh, it was felt that it would be a good idea for us to better embrace if we want to, first of all, provide those who are uh, offering services based on Envoy the stability that they need to be able to make product guarantees to customers. And second, for folks who are outside of Envoy to be able to actually rely on these uh, APIs and uh, where their release and deprecation cycles are completely decoupled from those of Envoy. So, in response to that, I essentially have a proposal, which I've shared. There's both the long form, which is like 20 odd pages in a short form uh, version of it, uh, which is like a, a couple of pages. And it basically just describe how we can take what we have today with the V2 APIs and turn this into a, a sort of an ongoing evolution of the APIs. And there's a number of, uh, you know, we, we were essentially going from a world of V2 XDS APIs to V3 LDS. V4 um, bootstrap, V6 
um, you know, leaf header map helper, V7 data formats. So basically a family of APIs, which really in reality, the Envoy APIs were all along, uh, each with their own independent sort of major versions and release cadence. Uh, they basically all follow a single clock, but beyond that, they will evolve uh, somewhat independently. Uh, the main thing that we can, we, okay, a really big win that we get from the, for the Envoy community is we get a cleanup of our technical data in the APIs, and be able to make our breaking changes without the fear of actually having any existing users affected. Um, only users of uh, the new API versions that we make these breaking changes in the alpha APIs are affected by changes. And we're essentially in this position where um, existing APIs will have no breaking changes. And so that's pretty great. Um, the doc contains a lot of technicalities over how we're gonna deal with things like tooling and minor versions and uh, version discovery and feature discovery and quirks around how to deal with clients which may not support the full feature set. Uh, I probably don't want to go into too much detail here. I'm more interested in sort of hearing from folks if they have questions about any of these specific items. The goal is to maintain a release cycle for Envoy which will still be quarterly and uh, just as it is today. And we, and on top of that, we will also do uh, API major version releases and spin outs once per year. The initial target for that is end of Q2. So yeah, I'll open it up to any questions at this point. Um, I think I have some concern mainly about like how much churn we will have when we improve when we bumped uh, like a version of the API like we did like in the exhaust it bump from v2 alpha to v2 and there's a lot churn to having like two uh, version of API registered in server side and in envoy side in control plane side and data plane side and that go back and forth a couple of times. Do we have uh, like tool chains to support that in both sides? Um, yeah. Um, so on the Envoy side, the plan is definitely to make that as painless as possible by writing lots of tooling to automate things like, you know, if you need to copy protos across with only a single field difference and build all the code to ingest that, that will be largely, the plan is to automate that away with reflection tooling and so on. Yeah. Uh, now, you are right that any management server, at least during rollouts and so on, is going to need to probably support two major versions realistically, um, uh, at least. And that is, I understand Go is very verbose and cumbersome. I personally don't have plans to build out, you know, Go control plane or management server sort of uh, tooling for that. I feel that problems should be solved. I think once we establish some good patterns for doing this in C++ for Envoy. It should be relatively easy to say, well, Envoy works that way and they managed to reduce that code churn by using reflection and code generation. Let's just do the same in Go. And that should be a, a relatively straightforward exercise. You so say that, but not, nothing is straightforward in Go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's my impression too, so. Yeah, I, I mean, I personally, I don't think I, I can commit, I can commit to doing a lot of the work or either myself or my team for stuff, which is you know, necessary to enable the Envoy side of this and for the uh, data plane API protos. Um, but the actual, all this Go work, I mean, just like, I mean, frankly, like I'm, I don't think I'm qualified to do the Go work. I'm, I'm not a Go developer. This is, I'm, I'm a hello. Uh, so, so. It's a, it's a reasonable point though, that most of our consumers for these protos are Go. So I, I, I would say that we need to be cognizant of the pain that we might cause people. So uh, maybe like as we start doing some technical discovery, we can loop in some folks and just try to get a feel for what it would mean on the Go side. And yeah. to be honest, it might be enough uh, to loop in the gRPC people because they have a vested interest in making it work well for Go. So they they actually, that this might be the forcing function that we need that they can try to make some of this a little less painful. I, I agree. And also just keep in mind that the timelines over how this plays out are a bit different. So we, we need to get, really get the Envoy side of things, the client side of things happening and the, and the API repository like this quarter if we want to hit our original goals. 
But then we have like a whole year after that where V2 is still a fully supported API and we'll have V3 as well. And so that's like an entire year in which we can work on the server side of this to uh, start supporting um, uh, uh, ro rollover um, and rollouts. So um, yeah, definitely, I don't think we're gonna to touch anything on the management side by the end of Q2. And then we'll probably use um, some combination of, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll reach out to folks, we'll hear from the community what their pain points are and uh, ideally prioritize stuff. I mean, obviously we, we all have a vested interest in making the APIs work. And so if we are finding at the end of, let's say in a year and a quarter that it's just so difficult for people to do rollouts that it's completely blocked, well, that, that would be a failure situation. So we need to avoid that happening by, um, you know, basically just watching what goes on as people do these rollouts, then probably refocusing our efforts on perhaps even on the control plane side as, uh, as needed. Does that help, Lizard? Yep. Okay. Um, what, what else on the agenda? Well, um, just to let folks know that we're actually forming a working group for the University Data Plane API, which is just had the CNCF uh, technical uh, committee uh, approval. So we will uh, be kicking this off shortly. I let me just link to the actual. Uh, Sorry. What's our plan for general? I mean, the plan is that there will be a few members from the Envoy community there. Uh, we, 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 the idea is that we keep this community fairly focused on um, um, Okay, I just link there. Um, that we, we keep it reasonably small and focused, but we will be relaying information back to Envoy community and um, provide opportunities for other parties who have legitimate need to be members of this committee to join. Like it's a generally, basically it's, you know, it's, a, I guess a semi-public forum is the way I would describe it. Um, I think that they'll, there, there's going to be a learning curve where I don't think we know how engaged people will, will want to be. So I think we'll need to see. But I think right now we have commitments from uh, all, of the, all of the major clouds and, and effectively from the load balancer side, Envoy and gRPC. So I think initially it's still going to be Envoy focused, but even there there's value in making sure that the APIs evolve in a way that meet the needs of all of the cloud providers. I think the goal is to invite, um, uh, you know, would be to invite other load balancers, like whether that be HA proxy, Nginx, Linkerd, whatever. I, I, I don't know that they're going to be interested, but I think that's the goal. Yeah. Um, and also I, I think, you know, things for like, you know, client side, like mobile and hard, even hardware load balancers could yep. benefit from this. Yeah. Um, that's, that's probably looking a bit further out. Um, yeah, so those are the main topics. Um, does someone want to give us, I, I think it probably is worth r uh, raising and just have uh, Liz and Matt chat about is what's going on with stability of uh, CI and yeah, I was I, I was actually going to ra raise that as our as our next topic of discussion. Yeah. Also, um, do you want to give an update, Lizan? Oh wait, for for that, just I mean, just in general, our current CI status, like what's what's going on, what what are some of the things that are in progress? Um, so the CI CI stability. Um, so I have a couple of the. Um, evaluation PR goes out, which trying um, uh, to speed up CI um, for a couple uh, items. One is the RBE, which I expect to um, do the full build and test within around 10 minutes uh, for the OCI. And the one is the coverage state speed up to switch from uh, GCOV R to um, LVM, LVM coverage. 
And I think we can trigger the um, GCC to uh, cloud search for the release build as well. That will speed, my, uh, speed up the build um, much as well. Yeah, and then I guess the other thing that's ongoing is we're evaluating the Azure pipelines, right? Yeah, so, yeah. Azure pipeline evaluation is ongoing. That's from um, yeah. mainly from CNCF um, have a, a deal with Microsoft, right? And uh, it works out uh, well at as of now for the Mac builds. So I'm kind of planning to switch from uh, Circle for Mac um, yeah. probably this week or next week. I, so. I think one of the things that we need to do, which maybe you and I, Lizan, can take offline, is I know that Ite got a new job, mm -hmm. um, which you know probably means that he doesn't have as much time to work on mm -hmm. Repo Kitty. Mm -hmm. And like, I do want to know specifically you know, what APIs does Azure pipelines have? And like, yeah. do, like, do they have the APIs that we need mm -hmm. to just move away from circle? Because if that's the case, I think per our, so I guess for people out there that don't know, there's a, there's a permission issue effectively where we, we, we need to have a permission model that potentially allows trusted people to get faster builds. And then there's a slow path for random PRs. So like mm -hmm. if you're in the org or you're trusted in some way, we could send your bill through the, through the RBE and it would be very mm -hmm. fast. Mm -hmm. um, and then if you come in, you know, via untrusted, you would go through the slow path or something like that. Um, um, but like, but, but circle doesn't have any such permission model today. Um, the good thing I think we can evaluate is Azure pipeline have the GitHub comment support like slash AZP build by org members and that can trigger oh. with some permission. We can look into that as well. Okay, yeah, let's let's take that offline and I'm yeah. wondering actually if it would make sense to do like a short one page spec on what we're trying to do because sure. I think optimally it would be really nice if this could be built into into repo kitty, right? Because then mm -hmm. it would all be like a like a unified system. And if yeah. they have the APIs, it shouldn't be that hard. Yeah. Okay, so maybe you and I can chat offline and let's, mm -hmm. because I, I think what I want to do is that if, if, if Ite is too busy to work on the repo kitty mm -hmm. changes, I think we can have CNCF find us another contractor to work with Ite to, 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 to do the changes. Sure. Cool. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Okay, uh, anything else? Uh, I think we're gonna start planning for Envoy Con 2019, which will be co-located uh, with KubeCon in San Diego in early November. So if you're interested in uh, helping on the program committee, uh, let us know offline. I had a quick follow up uh, on these. On, how's the remote build executor working out? Have you found that to be useful? I just saw your PR opened. Um, so the RBE uh, PR currently is using the Google's uh, managed service to. Uh, to run the build. So basically it spawns out like um, 100 to 200 workers remotely and submit the uh, uh, artifacts needed by the each worker and uh, that's a Bazel defined protocol between the Bazel and the uh, server. I, I can send you a link uh, for the RBE um, Bazel documentation later. Uh, uh, I'm familiar with it. I was just wondering how, how it's been working out for the Envoy code base. When I tried it uh, six to eight months ago, it was pretty uh, sketchy. I had like a lot of problems with the generals and whatnot. So yeah, the, the plus plus uh, tier chain configuration is kind of a bit hard for RBE since we need to generate pre-generate the cross tool files for the Docker image you're using for RBE. 
And uh, I think uh, six or three months ago, we still have the uh, repository rules that build the um, dependencies in shell script and there's a lot of stuff that uh, doesn't work well with RBE. Uh, we already uh, deprecated and removed those repository rules. We have external uh, CC, CMake stuff and that helped a lot to uh, for the migration to RBE. Yeah, that makes sense now, thanks. Cool. Bye. 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 <clears throat>